welcome to the podcast, Sally. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. How are you doing? You're well? Yeah, I'm, I'm well. That's as much as can be asked at the, at the moment, in the middle of third lockdown. I know, free, free's the charm, isn't it? I mean, hopefully by the time this actually is, we'll be out of uh, lockdown. One can, uh, one can dream. That would be amazing. Oh, you might even be vaccinated. Think the possibilities. Ooh. Maybe I don't. Uh, without being too personal, what are you? I'm, I'm guessing you're. I'm lowest possible class. Yeah, I don't. I, I <laughs> I'm don't right wanna, at the bottom of the list. I don't want to say an age because that's rude. But yeah, I mean, so I, I'm I'm 29, so I guess I'm pretty low. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I'm relatively. 28, healthy. so yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Okay, that's yeah. good then. Good. Um, but obviously, we're not here to talk about vaccinations because I'm woefully ill prepared for that. But your your <laughs> your background is you're an evolutionary biologist that's right correct yes so in layman's terms what does that entail so um i look to animals and in particular i like looking at animal behavior and not just kind of looking at how they do what they do uh, and like the mechanisms behind it and the chemistry behind it um but very much why they do what they do so why has this behavior evolved? Why do we see it? What adaptations is it for? And then because evolution is amazing and all animals have to follow the same basic rules, just in the same way that every part of the universe has to follow the laws of physics, you can take stuff that you learn from one animal and apply it to another. So I studied fruit flies, but I wasn't particularly interested in fruit flies. I was more interested in them because they're easy to study and they can tell us about everything else. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I was having a look at your YouTube channel, which is obviously the, the main reason we're having a chat today and just looking mm -hmm. at some of the topics. And like, I think one of them was animals prostituting themselves. Yeah. And it was, uh, I mean, you've changed my view of penguins completely. Like penguins <laughs> Daily penguins. Oh my goodness. They are, um, they have lots of deviant antics, shall we say. But yeah, so the first um, behaviour that I studied in fruit flies is their mating behaviour. So I know an awful lot about the sex lives of different animals. Obsessed. <laughs> in a, in a sci strictly scientific yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. We're good, glad we cleared the air on that. And so so what goes, how do you go from that kind of background then to, to starting a, a YouTube channel? So what prompted you to start making science and nature content for YouTube? So for me, actually, the the uh, video science communication side actually predates the evolutionary biology side. Ah, okay. So I must have been about four when I wanted to be a science presenter on TV. I have always been very influenced by TV. I used to watch um, Animal Hospital and Time Team and David Attenborough and all of those kind of things. I'm like, I want to do that. That would be great. And I've actually just been watching a load of home videos over Christmas of me doing exactly that age five, six, seven, eight, all the way up. And so when I went to uni as an undergrad to do biology, I thought, well, when I finish this degree, no one's going to hire someone who's just got a pure science degree and no background in media or anything like that. I didn't know anyone in TV. So I was just like, well, there's this thing that's kind of just started. It'd been around for a while, um, but it wasn't really the sort of thing where people had it as a career yet. That totally wasn't a thing. It was still just a hobby for everyone. And there were a few science channels that were just starting out. And I'm like, I can do that better. Someone made a video about biology. I'm like, you're not even a biologist. Why are you making this video? I could do it so much better. So I've made it and have taught myself how to do every aspect of, of YouTubing and videography. And then, yeah, and then I thought, well, I might as well do a PhD don't do a PhD on a whim kids um but I did and so YouTube has just kind of been always going on throughout that so a PhD is that se seven years is it to do one or so normally it's four four, uh, four well okay. three three and a half is the standard right. um the modern things the DTC CDTs um these are funded doctoral training programs by the government they're normally four mine took five because the biology department building got shut down for a year <laughs> Ah, not yeah. ideal. Not, not <laughs> ideal. It did prepare me really well for a pandemic, though. Yeah, there you Having go. Having everything in your life completely thrown up in the air and you have no idea when you're going to get your life back. Turns out that was quite useful training. Get something out of it. it, it it's interesting that you mentioned about the TV side, because in many ways, kind of YouTube, it is, it is different to the TV market. But in a way, the power of TV, I would say in in recent years has gone down a little bit like not as nowhere near as many people watch tv as they used to and you know certainly 
if you're looking at kind of under 30s a lot of them are watching youtube and, and online stuff now so you know youtubers are i, I don't want to use the word celebrities but certainly well known and i don't suppose youtubers and influencers are necessarily the same thing but it's the same ballpark isn't it so so influencer is more what the advertisers like to call us because right. the thing that we do for them is we influence people to buy products or change their opinion but it would be like calling a film star oh they're a ticket seller like because they get yeah. bums on seats it's like that's not what they're doing they're acting yeah, and they okay. are actors um so yeah people call us influencers and it's like well i think i do more than just influence people uh, like do you not like know. that term then it's just quite reductive. I mean, I, I use it because people understand it, um, okay. but it very much is reducing us down to the fact that we can sell people stuff ultimately or, or change their minds in a way that benefits a company. So I would yeah. say you have like content creator is the most generic version. But back to what you were saying about team. Yeah, so the, the most popular YouTubers and YouTube channels regularly get, far more views than like your BBC Two, BBC Four documentaries. Um, and like, yeah, a lot of TV producers look at the figures that YouTube videos get and are just shocked. Yeah, I bet it doesn't surprise me. I mean, so what? at what point did you think, oh, this is, this is working, people are watching me? Because I think you're, I had a nosy, you're on 81,000 subscribers, which is pretty- That's gone up since last time I looked. There you go, I'm, help, I'm helping you out. Um, I think I think that's good. I mean, well, I think that's really good, isn't it? I mean, I know, um, I mean, in, right at the bottom of it, if you're over a thousand and you've got so many hours, then you can monetize it. And then I guess the next milestone is, I don't know, 10K is pretty good. 10,000 is a big one. 10,000 yeah. opens you up to more features. Does it? Okay. Yeah. The YouTube space being a big one is a physical building, like co-working space in London. That's why I was in London for two years. Ah, um, oh, well, you, it, you can go and use that, can you? Yeah, so it's like free filming studios, editing suite and just co-working area and training and, and events and things once you get 10K. But oh. of course, it's all closed for the pandemic. Yeah. Well, so yeah. that's why I moved out of London. But that was great because it's very isolating working on your own as a YouTuber. Is that the one near St Pancras? Is it yes. there? Yeah, I think I've seen that. Yeah. Um, but so so is that when you sort of thought I can make something this when you hit 10K or, or was it more than that or when? So I'm trying to think. So I... I was kind of making videos, so I've been doing it for eight years now, um, and I was doing it for about three years or so. I remember I won a competition at The Guardian that kind of gave it a little bit of a boost. Um, they were doing like a student film competition thing, got one, one on Evolution, that was nice. Um, but then I got approached by GE, General Electric, um, who somehow, because at the time I didn't have like a huge following, I can't even remember now, I must have had around the 10,000 mark, as a, I can't even remember, maybe it was 20,000, small number of thousands, and they said, do you want to be our creator in residence for three months in the States? <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is in the middle of my PhD, so I took a term out of my PhD. Um, and yeah, so then it was a paid job Blow, fly me out to the States for three months, uh, making videos for this ginormous uh, engineering company. And yeah, just traveling throughout the whole of the States and filming. And that's when I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I can see this being a job. I like yeah. this. So is it, is, is that your main job? Is that, is that what you would, so someone says to you, uh, Sally, what, what's, your, what's your job? Is it like a collection of jobs or do you kind of have one broad title or so i am a freelance science youtuber is how i would do it okay. so um my lance is free for various companies to hire uh and they can hire me. so i do lots of little jobs working for companies uh usually the videos go on my youtube channel sometimes i'll make them for their own youtube channel but they will pay me to make a video about a topic of their choice or about a discovery okay. or sometimes it will be just like can you stick an ad in the middle of your video but i tend not to do those type i tend to do like the we just made a huge discovery on like antibiotic resistance can you make a video about that or we've got this new technology in recycling plastic can you make a video on that okay the, the ads can be a little bit jarring sometimes they're, they're kind of the not the ones at the beginning that you can skip the ones where youtubers i always like the ones where someone's promoting something that's got fuck all to do with what their youtube channel is you know it'd be like yeah. Oh, this is a, a science one, but here's manscaping or uh, yes, or or some some random thing. You're like, 
what are you, you know, I, I understand people have got to eat and they've got to keep the bills on. So that's why they do that. But it can be a bit like, why are you promoting something that's got- I think that's partly, be, it feels very odd to British audiences. Right. Americans are so used to, because I think we have a maximum of something like eight minutes of advertising within any one hour on TV. Yeah. And obviously a lot of us watch the BBC, which has zero advertising. And so we're not used to being constantly bombarded by adverts. The UK has very strict ad rules. In the US, like they say that they've got an hour program. It's actually only 42 minutes because 18 minutes of that hour are adverts. They are used to constantly being advert having their program broken up by adverts. So they it get it while they're watching as well, don't they? They get the little things that's got at the bottom. Yeah, so it just doesn't feel as jarring, I think, to American audiences as it does to British audiences. Uh, okay, I, I went. I was in Cuba last year. And they, they got a bit of American TV. And that that was, it's funny you say that because it was a little bit like, God, they're relentless. It is just like, yeah. bah, 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 you know, mm -hmm. uh, buy tablets that will cure you for this disease. You're like, and again, like, because we've got the NHS, like, oh my God, they're selling drugs. Yeah, the medical advertising is oh, wonderful. It's like, and then the really quick bit, like, oh, may, may grow a spearhead or something like that at the end of it. And you're like, <laughs> may what cause death. Yeah. You're just like, what the hell is going on? So, yeah, another world to us, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, are there any downsides? Of, I'm sure there are a few, but are there any downsides of being a YouTuber? Oh, where do you want me to start? <laughs> I mean, you're asking me in the, uh, the tail end of a year of a pandemic, which has not been kind to this YouTuber. No. So um, it's it's very fickle in, in every possible sense. And there is no essence of or even thought of job security or stability. So, I mean, you must be quite similar because you're, as far as I can tell, a freelance photographer, videographer, right? You, you never have one long contract. No, I mean, yeah, I might, might, if I'm lucky, I might do something for a year, maybe. Yeah. But um, no, I, I don't know if I'm going to be working from one month. To, I, I, the way I kind of work is I know roughly what I'm doing three months in advance. Beyond those three months, fuck knows. You know, I, I might be out on the streets in a cardboard box, which, you know. Exactly. So it's very similar for YouTube. Sometimes the time scales are even shorter. Let's say for science, because science videos take longer to make than other types of videos because of all the research that's involved. So those, yeah, the I normally do videos, uh, contracts on a one video basis. So I might only work with a company on one video and that contract will be two months long and that's it. And I have no idea where I'm getting my money from. Um, yeah, working on your own. As a lot of YouTubers work as part of teams, but they are the larger channels and I'm not yet at that point. So, so you're working, is it? Yeah, so you're working for yourself and you are your own boss in every bad way, which means that you never get to leave work. And if you don't get something done, it's your fault and you've got to set all of your, like everyone says, oh, it's great being your own boss. Who wants to be a boss, right? <laughs> I don't want to be the one disciplining my staff, AKA me. Uh, and yeah, it's a, a huge part is the instability of it. It's because each contract is very lucrative. It's several months of rent for a decent sponsored video, but you have no idea how many of them you're gonna get in a year. And that is just a very precarious lifestyle. So it's not so much about, um... The, the ad revenue in YouTube, it's more the sponsored videos of the ones that kind of keep you uh, moving for me, along. Yeah. yeah, for me, yeah. AdSense, which are the little pop-up or the skip through ads yeah. at the start, might as well not exist because you've got to be making, you've got to be getting 100,000 views a month or so for that to be really, because that's purely on a views basis. So right. if you're getting 10 million views on each video and you post a video a month sure AdSense is going to be great for you or if you're the type of channel that can produce a lot of content so vloggers react uh, beauty gaming all of these people can have a lot of videos each with a medium number of views you're going to get a lot of AdSense my videos take a long time to make and so far are only getting I mean they're getting tens of thousands of views but it's not like hundreds or millions of views so yeah adsense might as well for me not exist yeah no i'm with you i mean i'm i think my channel's on about five thousand, which i know is a fart in the wind it's not a great deal but i get about i don't know every every two or three months about 90 quid something like that which isn't it's not That's enough for, good. 
Yeah, is that good, is it? Okay. Yeah, um, I'd say that's good. So, you know, it's it's not enough to make me think, oh, I need to change my career to that. But, you know, it, it's beer money and um, maybe down the line, if it got a bit more, I'd consider it. But it's just something that just... It, put it this way, it the... doesn't cover the cost of an Adobe subscription. <laughs> no, no, not really. So, so, yeah, there are a lot of overheads when it comes to YouTube. Definitely. And do you ever get it where, I mean, I always think that YouTube's great because everyone's got a voice. And I think it's terrible because everyone's got a voice. Because in the comments section, it can be an absolute, YouTube in particular could be a real sewer. Like, you know, so let's say you post a video about um, why an orange is round, or I, I don't know, something like that. And then someone will comment something, again, unrelated, maybe just post a racist comment. And say, you're like, where are you getting this from? Like, why the hell are you... You know, and people will start piling in and arguing, and it's just like, wow. I have a very long list of block words. <laughs> I bet, I bet. There, there are some, someone has made the most humongous list of every spelling and misspelling and alternate spelling of various words and slurs that you can just copy and paste and so they automatically uh, get filtered out, which means that you still see them when you look through your filtered list, but people aren't then, it's not piling on and getting a snowball effect yeah. also most my viewers are middle-aged men usually from the science and tech industries so they tend to be really quite nice yeah. and they see yeah. me as a person still um and a lot of my friends who are more successful at youtube than me almost don't want to go on the trending page so the trending page is the one that is shown to absolutely everybody like including people that aren't signed into youtube because once your video hits trending, you are being exposed to the widest possible audience. So I have a nice little side of yeah, the internet. Yeah, 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 I get it. Once yeah. you get exposed to this bigger audience that don't know who you are, don't care about you as a person and don't know anything about you, that's when the hate really starts to pile <laughs> on. Yeah, I, I made the mistake of, um, so I've just been doing the odd bits for Country File at the moment. And uh, I thought, oh, I'll Google myself uh, on Twitter. I'll see what people are saying on Twitter. Jesus Christ, don't do it to yourself. Like, what have they been saying? So I've not, uh, I've never actually been on TV yet. I've done radio okay, cool. and um, YouTube, but I've never come across the TV um, side of things. So I did one about terrapins and you might already know this, but terrapins will breathe uh, through their arse when they hibernate because they'll, they'll use their orifices to uh, extract oxygen. So I, I kind of said that in a relatively simple way because it's country far. They don't like too big a word on it. And um and people were just like, oh, this guy, I wouldn't let him near my kids. He looks at turtles' asses and think, I'm just like, <laughs> like, where are you getting this from? Uh, well, I know where they're getting it from, but you were know. Were you saying this while in your dry suit, looking like no. an absolute idiot? No, in I wasn't. like 50 centimetres of water. <laughs> no, no. I was, yeah, I want to point out to the people listening to this podcast that Jack and I have never met, but it's one of those things where you see each other's work. I've seen videos of you, you've seen videos of me. So I feel like I know what you do and know. But I've seen you in your dry suit, and I because I do scuba diving as well. So what what an ass to get those things on and off. Um, I'm used to it. And yeah. Carry them everywhere. But then it's just the fact that you're all donned up and everything, and you're like into the stream that's got maybe 50 centimeters of water in it. It's because I'm in there for a long time, so I need yeah, to keep. Yeah, I, I mean, I can totally yeah. understand it. Yeah. But yeah. it just does look a little bit ridiculous. Oh yeah, I mean, um, and again, like in public, you, you're wearing that and either people won't talk to you because they're like, what the hell is this guy doing? Or um, or they talk to you more because they want to know what you're doing. And, and it's, um, yeah, I try and humour people as best I can, but it can get a little bit annoying. I'm like, I'm at my work job, piss off, you know. <laughs> so I don't know, but yeah, it's, it's a weird one. Um, so if someone is thinking of doing a, a science YouTube channel, have you got any advice for them? If they're thinking, look, I, I really like what Sally's doing. Uh, I'd like to do something um, along those lines. What advice would you would you give them? So, I mean, the first thing is just to start. You you won't know if you enjoy it until you start doing it. And the way you learn is to do it and make loads of mistakes. And you have the benefit at the beginning of nobody watching your videos. And you think, oh, I need to get more and more people watching my videos. But once you get an audience, you feel a lot more restricted because I don't want to go too much into the YouTube algorithm because frankly, no one actually knows it. And most of this <laughs> it's is It's a just, rabbit hole, isn't it? Jesus. It's a lot of old wives tales when it comes to the YouTube <laughs> algorithm. Um, but in general, it rewards you for being consistent and having the same format and the same type of content. So once you get this audience, it's actually quite hard to try out new things, try out new styles. 
so enjoy that period when you don't have an audience to try out different things and see what works for you what doesn't work for you and be very wary of anyone who tells you how to get successful on youtube because the vast <laughs> majority of them got successful on youtube 10 years ago which might as well be a different platform it's like someone on a, a big tv person telling you how to be successful on youtube they're just different things youtube 10 years ago versus youtube now are completely different and um, there is an awful lot of confirmation bias in, I do these things and I'm a successful YouTuber. And therefore, if you do them, you'll become a successful YouTuber. And that's just a load of bull. There is, you've got to accept there is a huge amount of luck involved in YouTubing. And if you're not getting the traction, it doesn't necessarily mean that you suck. If you suck, you're probably not going to get very far. <laughs> but if um, you're not getting very far, it doesn't necessarily mean it's because you suck. I guess as well, it's um, it's a case. Sorry, I, I, my, my my mind died. Then it's <laughs> you, you rebooting, just, rebooting. <laughs> been a long day. I had an eye test earlier. My brain's hurting. Um, <laughs> it, YouTube's more forgiving, I find, than television. In that you know you can have someone just holding a camera, waffling to it, which wouldn't you wouldn't see on TV really. But YouTube, even if the camera work's not amazing, I mean, I watch stuff and I think. It's bloody awful, but it suckers me in. And you're like, oh, I like this. I'll watch another one. So uh, I, I do appreciate the, the channels that do have a certain quality to them. But, you know, you see some channels and they've got hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And it's really simple. It's just like one person holding a camera, talking to it, you know, and, and, and whatever. So I think YouTube is quite a forgiving platform in, in a way. Yes. I will also say that there are literally millions of channels that are also holding a camera and talking to it that you're not seeing yeah um so i think that production values do increase your chance at success but you sh they shouldn't hold you back um modern camera phones have amazing cameras on them oh my goodness sometimes i use my phone instead of my fancy camera to take pictures of things just because i can't be asked to get my big camera out um so that like technology shouldn't be the thing holding you back um, and that certainly you have to work to your format. So although I call myself a YouTuber, I also make videos for um, Instagram and Twitter and I'm trying out the, the newfangled thing called TikTok. Uh, it's, no. it's great. Honestly, I've kind of had to stop using it because it's so addictive. My, my, uh, I was in, in bed with my wife last night. Um, not too many details, but yeah, we were in bed and, uh, and she was just on her phone. So that was it. It was nothing exciting. And she was going through TikTok and I was just like, because obviously I'm aware of it, but it is, yeah, it's like, bam, bam, bam. You can get through it pretty easily, but it's more like, it's like comedy sketches, isn't it? Or like people do the, little funny stuff on it. It's everything. Is it everything? In the same okay. way that YouTube is everything. Okay. The okay. discovery mechanism on TikTok is a million miles from the discovery mechanism on YouTube. So the two are, comp they are completely different things okay. youtube rewards you for consistency tiktok it's on a one video basis uh youtube once it's been like the first 24 hours it will get 99 percent of the views it's ever going to get tiktok they deliberately boost it after a few weeks like the systems are completely different which is why i'm trying out tiktok okay. um, because it tends to be shown to a wider uh, certainly a broader audience than youtube um but yeah so i try and do video things for each thing so be very aware of the platform that you're posting to because each one has its kind of grammar and its cultural norms and yeah. so watch if you want to be a youtuber watch a lot of youtube i suppose that's how yeah, i should that sum makes, up my advice that makes sense it's, it's interesting you say that because definitely each social media platform so i mean i instagram facebook and twitter are the main ones but it's weird i'll post the same thing with the same hashtags on all three and one of them it might blow like twitter typically go does really well for me because i've got the biggest following on that but then Facebook can be almost dead. Hardly anyone looks at it and and, uh, and Instagram might do okay. So I, I, I don't know, it's all... That's interesting because your your career is very photo-based. So I would imagine Instagram to be your biggest of the three. Yeah, no, it's growing. I mean, I've stagnated at like two and a half thousand uh, followers for ages. And I don't, I mean, I, to be honest, social media, I get a little bit tired of it. And I should, I, I know what I need to do. I need to do more hashtags. And I need to interact with people. I can't be asked interacting with people. It makes me sound really antisocial. It's just, I, I that's I, why I don't do Facebook anymore. No, I've got enough platforms. I, I, I should get rid of it really. But yeah, I, 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 I've got enough in my life without talking to random ass people and whatever. I mean, I'm not rude. If people talk to me, I'll talk back. But 
I don't know. I've got enough going on. I, I should really get on it, but I should hire someone to do it, to be me and do all that. And, and, and that would probably grow it. But yeah, I, I just kind of very, my numbers trickle up slowly and I'm okay with that. And, you know, it's fine by me. I mean, yeah, if it works, if, if, if you're getting enough work without it, then yeah, yeah you don't I, go into that, that hole. No, definitely. So uh, I noticed you've got quite a few videos on bananas. Is there a particular passion for bananas? Like why, why that? No, um, no. <laughs> so I, I got an email that asked me how many sides does a banana have? Well, it didn't actually ask me that. It said that the pub quiz answer was five and they wanted to know why. Okay. But if someone tells me, ask me why does a banana have five sides? My initial thought is, does a banana have five sides? Like, you gotta make sure that the fact is correct before you then fact check it um, or before you then justify it. And so for that video, as you do, I bought 280 bananas. And once you've bought 280 bananas, you're gonna make a few videos from it. <laughs> So that's why I have three videos on it. To be fair, it's more two videos, but I also did a stand-up uh, comedy yeah, sketch about yeah, yeah. it. And so you've got the the, the video, the YouTube, talking about formats again, you've got the YouTube format version of that sketch and the, the straight stand-up comedy version of that sketch. So yeah, once you've got 280 bananas, you're going to get your money's worth and make a few videos from that. I'm assuming you didn't eat them all. No. So the reason that I was so glad about having a comedy club audience, and one of my friends runs this kind of geeky comedy night, was that I could then, I was like, oh, I would buy all of these bananas, but then I'm just going to be stuck with this many bananas. And there is only so much banana bread one can make. And this was pre-pandemic. But no, I was quite glad because then I could chuck them all out to the audience, get them to do all the data collection for me and have a bit of an Oprah moment where I'm like, and you get a banana and <laughs> you get a banana. But unfortunately, I am not particularly good at physical education and my throwing was a little bit off and I may have hit a few people in the audience. Like Mario Kart, that's where they throw bananas, isn't it? You just kind of start... Uh, Possibly, yeah. I'm also not much of a gamer, but uh, yes, I think they have bananas there. There you go. So I was, I was going to say, how do you pick topics? But then is it just more of someone... Is, is it, It's not so much that you do what you want to do, it's you do what you're hired to do, or is it a blend? It's a mix. So a lot of the videos on my channel aren't sponsored videos, so they are just videos that I make to boost my profile i don't really get paid for them per se so yeah it's just something that i'm interested in that I'm, as every science youtuber will tell you it's not how do you find the story it's how do you pick which of the thousands of topics you have in your head uh, like i wrote a note down um i was having a chat with my friends normally it comes from a chat in my friend with my friends in the pub wonder why my inspiration has dropped in the last year um where someone was saying that this American ice cream company that is famous for making these little blobs of ice cream is the other people being consulted about vaccine transportation because they specialize in deep freezing and extra and cryogenic technology. I'm like, that is fascinating. And then I also saw on Twitter, there was a thing where you would, people were posting Amazon reviews of products that they've used in field work because most biologists have a very limited budget. And so we have to, we don't have specialized equipment for things. We just buy things and then give them another purpose. And so someone was saying, ah, oh, yes, this sieve is perfect for extracting the bones from dried up hyena poo, or this is the perfect size to fit around a lizard's neck. Uh, and really, and so I just love that idea of repurposing existing things for scientific uses. And so that I'm like, all right, jotting that down, that could be a video idea. So it's just kind of through everyday life, these things come into my head and I jot them down and sometimes they will make a good video and sometimes they won't. Yeah, I think that's a good way to do it. I mean, I, I've, I've certainly tried to do it now where rather than chasing views, I'll, I'll just do what I want to do, really, whatever uh, I, I enjoy. I think if I enjoy making it, you've put a little bit more of yourself um, into it. So I think that's a good a good way to go. Uh, I was I was having a little, so I was having a nosy on your website. It's a very well designed website, I should say as well. Why thank you. And, um, I did it all myself. Did you? Oh wow, there you go. And this is where I should throw in a Squarespace sponsorship, but I'm yeah. not, I don't currently have an affiliate code for them. <laughs> I was going to say, are you sponsored by them? But yeah, I, I, I was. Every, I have had some videos have sponsored by them. I'm sure um, every YouTube moment. is sponsored by Squarespace at some point. They're bloody yes. everywhere, aren't they? They are mm -hmm. relentless. Uh, I'm sure they're good, but yeah. Um, and I had a look on your website anyway, and it said 
uh, there was an FAQ bit, and I quite I found it quite funny about the uh, the free talks bit because I'm assuming that you get bombarded with people asking you to do free talks. And I just like your kind of very straight answer, which is I need to eat. Please don't ask me to do free talks. Yeah, not quite bombarded, but no, I, okay. I do get a lot of people asking me to do things. And then you find out that actually they have no budget. Yeah. And it's like, well, you have a budget to hire the venue and you have a budget to hire the food and security and to pay for your website domain. And the person asking me is normally salaried and getting money but the speaker doesn't. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a common thing across most of the creative industries is that people think, oh, you're doing it because you love doing it. We're a charity, therefore can you do it for us for free? But when you are working in science communication, everybody you work for is a charity. <laughs> and just because they're a charity doesn't mean they don't deal in money. It just means that they don't make a profit. <laughs> and so it's like, you had a turnover last year of 24 million pounds, I think. Think you can spare 200 quid or so for a, a quick talk or what have yeah. you yeah no a, a, a amen to that sister i uh, i get it all the time mm -hmm. with people i mean yeah because a, a large proportion of my work's charity charities as well and it's just like look i i, I know you've got money give give me money <laughs> basically because yeah. yeah they'll uh, and half the time like they'll say do it for free and i'll say well no but here's what i can do it for and they go yeah okay and it's just like it makes you think how many people don't even think to to ask for the yes, money the steepest learning curve I had was learning how to negotiate and do the business side of things because it's yeah. really hard arguing for your own worth in terms of money yeah I'm very good at saying no I'm good at this but being able to say no you should be paying me an extra 500 quid for this yeah then becomes so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a phone call quite recently actually with, a, with an organization and they were like oh we'd, we'd, uh, we'd like you to come and uh, film in our lakes and see what we've got living in these lakes and I was like yeah great here, here's what I'll charge and they went oh no we, we can't pay you and I was like okay we've come to a bit of a, an impasse here then and they went all right then well if you can't uh, if you can't come and do it can you tell us how we can do it and I was like here's my consultancy fee well I was like I was like sorry and they were like well yeah if you're not going to come and do it why don't you just tell us how we can do it and I was like that's not how jobs work <laughs> like I'm not going to tell you how to do my job like you either pay me to do it or it doesn't or I'm not doing it anyway. Yeah. So um, I just kind of, we didn't fall out, but I was just like, no, that's not, that's not going to work for me. There are occasions when a company is offering something so cool that actually the money doesn't matter. And it, it would be like, I don't know what an equivalent for you be. What are the fish in Buckingham Palace Gardens, for example? Like no amount of money can get you that access. There yeah. are certain things yeah. where actually you're like, you know what, that is so cool that I'm going to do it anyway but the vast majority of the time that's not the case <laughs> yeah no yeah occasionally someone might pull on my heartstrings or um or it might be an organization um well not so much because I still charge organizations I get on with but you know yeah, there might be some circumstances where I go oh, okay go on then but yeah it's it's rarer than rarer than often to be honest I don't do it um, too often and there's a difference between how much I charge a charity and how much I charge a a for-profit company as well like I don't expect their budgets to be the same but I do still expect to get paid yeah yeah no definitely and, and rightly so you know what you do is in, you know you're incredibly hard working so why shouldn't you be paid a, a fair wage for those things so I don't think there's give there's us anything. all money <laughs> Just rain down money on creatives please that would be all those, absolutely all those one pound that's coin. it yeah I'd say dollar bills it's such a shame that we don't have a lower value note because I feel like that would be really fun but it's quite expensive once you start well, doing it with fibers with pound coins you yeah. know, <laughs> lit, but that might get dangerous that might get a little bit dangerous um so before we go I'm just going to touch on this this last uh, point so I um I, I was on winter watch this year as, as an, um, yes you were oh I loved winter watch so, this year I, I needed that so much it was great wasn't it and the, the the mindful moments and everything they're doing I think is absolutely fantastic but you raised rightfully you know raised a point really about the diversity is perhaps lacking a little bit in that. So I wondered um, what kind of prompted you to do it and were you surprised by the results? So, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Every time I watch something like Winter Watch or Spring Watch or Country File, I sit there and think, I could do that. How, how do I get to do that? And then oh, it's quite funny because this year, both my mum and I watched Winter Watch every single one. Uh, and because we're not living together, she'll phone me up afterwards. And it's always like, why don't you get on Winter Watch? And uh, <laughs> phone them up for 
I'm like, yes, mum, I would love to. That would be great. I'll just ring Chris. We've got a direct exactly, line. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, BBC. Yeah. My mum thinks I'd be great. Give me a job. Um, but it, then you do kind of notice who the people are and how did they get that job? And you start wondering, okay, so how did they know someone already on the thing? How, did their, how does their research process work and all of that? And yeah, I noticed that the first thing that switched me onto it was in the very first episode and maybe the first five minutes when um, Chris Packham says, don't worry, even though we're in lockdown and there's a restriction, we've got cameramen all around the country. And I, hang on a sec. Do you not have a single camera woman on your team? Like, it's, it's one of those annoying things like when people call you like, oh, hey guys, how's it going? Like, I know that you mean men and women, but technically it does just mean men. Um, and so it's one of those, we've got cameramen dotted all around the country. I'm like, maybe you mean camera crew dotted around the country. But then I'm like, no, maybe you do just mean that you only have men and there is no one else. And then kind of going through the program, I noticed the names of people and in the first week there wasn't a single um guest that was female shown on screen at all and and then the second week there was a few but really not many and so I just got really sick of it and so I, I sat down and watched the credits and paused it every few frames and literally wrote down every single name that was credited and every single person that had been shown on screen and every single person on the mindfulness moments that was listed on Twitter. And it was so, like, I kind of expected it. Um, I should have brought the stats up right now. I think it's 18% of the guest contributors I've got 16 in my notes. 16, there we go. 16% <laughs> of the guest contributors. So those are like the people that they asked, like like you or yeah. like a researcher who's been studying something or a conservationist. 16% of them were women. Um, and then cameras, zero out of, was it? 38. 38, yeah. yeah. Zero out of the 38 camera operators were female. Yeah. Um, at one point, I thought there was one, but then it turns out that J.O. Joe is a man. Right. Um, and not a woman. So I'm like, you don't even have one. You don't even have, like, that is just, I, I mean, I was, part of me isn't surprised, but... 28 men 20 no 38, 38 men sorry 38, 38 yeah. men there's another thing where someone posted 28 uh, educational youtubers and all of them were men so that's why i've got 28 stuck in my head <laughs> it's the same thing in science youtube it's very male yeah. but you're just like you are exclusively looking at wildlife through the eyes of men and yes there shouldn't be a difference between men and women certainly from a biological perspective and our ability to see there shouldn't be this difference other than perhaps women tend to be shorter so are closer to the ground maybe there's a thing probably not yeah but we have been raised differently by society to value different things and so you're going to get different perspectives on things like the things that you find interesting might be different to the things that i find interesting and there may be some sex-based differences for that be just because of how society is treated it's like I have been conditioned to think about family as like family is supposed to be really important for women or I don't know if you've got a pregnant camera woman she might have find a different piece of behavior interesting so yes it it does annoy me I mean with camera crew and camera operators it's a less visible problem so in terms of encouraging the next generation of people, like it's not something that the audience will notice until they start going into it. So yeah. if you want, if you're a budding camera operator and then you look up, oh, who are some people that I can try and follow the career of? And they're all men, that's going to be a bit off-putting. Yeah. But with guest contributors, you're basically saying that men are seven times better at doing conservation and wildlife than women are when you've got that much of a disparity and obviously that's not true biology is such a female science compared to all the other sciences it's not very female but compared to like physics or maths um it's a lot more female i know so many ecologists and conservationists that would be amazing on this program 
Hell, their research team was pretty darn female. The upper executives yeah, and producers yeah, yeah. were pretty female, it, but just obviously, and I don't think that I am in no way saying that they're doing this consciously. They're thinking, oh, they're a woman, therefore we're not going to have them on. Or we've already got no, one woman no, on this. It's, it's just no one is asking the question. Yeah. No one has stopped in the meeting to think, hang on a sec. We, we don't know. Like someone will have stopped in the meeting to say, okay, we've got... Uh, a water-based clip we've got a vt from scotland we've got a vt from the sea okay let's have a vt of a cute mammal so we've got a nice bit of balance within the program you just need someone to start to say okay of all of our contributors turns out that for an entire week of programming they're all men and in fact i think for the first week they were all white men as well um and you just need someone to say hang on a sec let's just get a bit of balance that yeah. should be all it takes yeah, it's a weird one because there are certainly, and again, you point out in the, in the blog that you did, there are camera uh, camera women, camera operators who are women. And you know, Tan Tanya Esteban was one you mentioned. There's off the top of my head, Claire Jones, Nina Constable, Sophie Darlington's a, a major camera operator. She's done some of the Blue Chip series. So it's not that they're not out there. They're certainly out there. Um, why they're not being given the opportunity, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the solution to it. And uh, when, and when I don't know really much about the camera operator field, but I imagine a lot of it is you work with someone and then they recommend you for something else. Uh, it's quite solitary. It's quite a solitary job, really. But um, yeah, I mean, and, I, and I've spoken about this multiple times on the podcast. Wildlife TV is, is very much not what you know, but who you know, to a degree, to a degree. You've got to back up with it, the skills, but yeah. certainly... Um, it, it, you can get on with a producer and they're more likely to use you next time. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, I guess they get to know more men. They use them more. I, I don't know. It's an area that I've not, not. Well, it's expert. getting that foot in the door. Yeah. And as I wrote in the blog, spring watch in that series is like the ideal training ground for these people. Yeah. Like sure. We've got women. Yeah. There were more women filming the blue planet series than there were on spring watch and or winter watch. And you're like, they, like if you want to have an, a new generation of talent put them on a show like spring watch because you've got lots of short sections instead of saying to someone okay i want you to go out all the way to the um i don't actually know where snow leopards live the himalayas they probably Himala the himalayas, they, are, right? they are in the himalayas yeah there we go we want to send you out for nine months to the himalayas you're going to be on your own filming this really elusive thing and it's going to be really important for this multi-million pound program or can you shoot us a nice um, piece about pigeons in the city? Like it's it's an easier task. The stakes are lower. So get younger, less experienced people on those sort of programs so that then they can go on to these bigger things. I will point out that um, I may have also done a quick tally of your podcast guests. No, no. And I, and I thought... <laughs> I thought this might come out and yeah, and I am trying to rectify it. Yeah, I mean, because this is the thing, I've seen them come up on YouTube and I'm like, oh, this seems to be a fair balance. Turns out that 12 are women and 41 are men, which is a 23% female ratio. But that's the yeah. thing as well, is that to me, I'm like, oh no, Jack has quite a few women on his thing. We are so used to seeing men everywhere yeah. that a small amount of women less than 50 percent we think is equal like yeah. there's been so, so many scientific studies on this it's like if women speak for 20 percent of the time at a meeting people think that they've they dominated the meeting yeah okay and you're like that's not the case um yeah. so yeah it's only once you start actually counting that you can spot the problem no. so that's that's kind of what i want people to do is no. if you've got the power then count <laughs> yeah no and it, it it does weigh on me so i in in my i feel like i'm in court now in my defense <laughs> um i do ask lots of women they don't always say yes so it's not through lack of trying i do contact lots you know i, I like a message michaela Strachan and other kind of bigger names and they largely just ignore me um it'll hit my uh, buffer then um but there are women who i probably could get on the podcast and i should uh, what what I tend to do is is pick a topic when I'm looking for someone to talk about it, and then I'll see who's best fitted for it. I I try not to go, oh well they they tick that box, but maybe I should because it speaks for other people who who would do that. So I I take your point definitely. I you know and I am trying to um, do. It. I mean I'm talking to um, trying to get more because it is very white my podcast as well. And again that's not intentional. I'm not trying mm -hmm. to just fit to a white audience. But I thought you know what I I need to get people from different backdrops 
so that other listeners might feel more kind of integrated in it. And I did. did well, think- again, it's, it is harder to include a wider group of people because white men like, you know, these people because they've been on TV, because yeah. you've seen their work in magazines. Yeah. And so when there's this entire system which is making men's work more visible, you've got to think a little bit harder to find people that are outside of that but the more that they are on these kind of podcasts or these kind of programs the easier it's going to be for then other companies to find them yeah like the more people you get on spring watch and country file the easier it's going to be for some blue chip producer to find that kind of talent yeah i agree i mean i I think i don't know I, i think it's getting better i don't know but compared to what it was before but i guess we've still got a long way to to go to try and uh try and get there and you know and, and looking into it a little bit further other kind of boxes uh like the, the queer community for example so when i say queer just so people realize it's not the slur it's, it's a reclaim word isn't it i, was, I got this from your coming out video because again mm-hmm. i being a um uh not in that community i don't know what the right terms are and whatever but it's difficult because it's not like you can guess by the name if someone is gay yeah. or straight or whatever so um my perceptions of, of when i've been to the natural history unit in bristol is that I've met people who I assume they they I mean I probably I maybe I shouldn't assume but I assume that they're gay and there's a, there's there's a few that I'm like oh they are but again what number is is acceptable or what number so not this acceptable. is yeah you know you know I'm, <laughs> I I'm, know exactly what I'm you panicking. mean because when I was when I was looking at the list of people for the winter watch thing so I must have written down about 100 200 names yeah. I can tell from a name whether they're male or female with a small degree of error. Yeah. And if I can't tell, I can do a quick Google search, an image pops up and I can see if they're male or female. It is a lot harder for me to tell the ethnicity of someone. I could, I just about managed to do the ethnicity for the guest contributors, but I know I will have made some mistakes. Um, Cause like, you don't know if someone who's mixed ethnicity defines yeah. himself as one or another. Yeah. And it was pretty low. And again, you have the issue of, well, what is normal? At the moment, we're still using 2011 census data, which is obviously Uh, 10 years out of date. And the non-white ethnicities, for want of a better phrase, are going to be increasing over the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, And so I think the UK is currently at about 12, 14% non-white ethnicities. Um, But then how do you expect that to change? Like if you're based in Bristol, Bristol is probably more white than somewhere like London. And if you've got your thing based there and if you've got international contributors, what do you expect it to do? So that one of the, I suppose, nice things about looking at diversity in terms of men and female, it's always 50% wherever you go. And it's pretty darn easy to tell at a glance. Yeah. There's obviously going to be some mistakes, but at a glance. But yeah, it's hidden diversities like... Um, sexuality or uh, mental health physical yeah. um like disability as well um i because i know that country file has a presenter in a wheelchair they do yes they do the name escapes me but they definitely do yeah and i think that is the only disabled wildlife outdoorsy presenter i have seen on tv like um, i have not seen many um physically disabled people no, there is another chap again. I, I can't remember the name. I know another one, but again, it's not. It's not many. Yeah, it's not many. And like, we totally need people because I can totally imagine, like, if you have physical disability and you can't walk very far, your experience with the natural world is going to be so different. And we want those people to be able to go out and enjoy wildlife, but they don't see anyone like them doing that. So think, oh, that's just a thing for able-bodied people. Yeah. And, and it is one of those things we just it's just nice to have more perspectives. Yeah, no, I, th- I think you're absolutely right. And I think um, it's the way that it, it, it needs to go, really. And, and hopefully it will go and, and kind of go in that. And obviously without uh, bringing it up, it's not a conversation people are as likely to have. So I think it was a good thing to kind of see that data and um, hopefully take action. I don't know. Did anyone ever I don't suppose any of the team or anyone kind of got in touch with you about it, did they? 
no one's got in contact with me but I do because I had to go through all 16 episodes or, or eight episodes sorry of the credits I do recognize the names of the vast majority of people involved in the winter watch program now and okay. a few of them followed me on twitter afterwards so I'm guessing that uh, people involved in the program have seen it yeah, but I have not had any contact no, from them I, I would hazard a guess they, they're definitely aware of it and they probably that would be something that they consider for spring watch i would yeah uh, i hope some think. emails have been sent round and they're like yeah. hmm okay while we're researching spring watch let's uh let's do a quick tally up before we put everyone on air instead yeah. of after it's been broadcast which in a way is is quite nice i mean it, it shouldn't be that you've got to prompt them to do that but in a way it's nice that something you've done has affected change i suppose i hope so yeah. well, we've got to see if it does affect change yeah first of all. exactly but, uh, yeah. yeah i hope i really hope that especially cuz spring watch is the big one of the three yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that they get more female guest contributors. Here's hoping. Well, look, it's great to talk about these things. As, as again, as like a as a, a white young straight man, I'm not a minority in the slightest. So it's you know it's good to talk to people about these these things and get the cogs turning. So and obviously talk about YouTube as well. So it's kind of hopefully given some people some ideas to prompt up their science channels if they're thinking of doing that and a little bit what goes behind it. So. Thanks for coming on and hopefully it wasn't too painful for you. I mean, come on, I get the chance to speak to a person in the middle of lockdown. I live on my own. I don't see people. This has been lovely. <laughs> awesome. I can pretend that I have friends. <laughs> You've got one at least anyway. There we go. Look, it's been a pleasure, Sally. Thank you very much. Take care.